Monster Hunter World Iceborne's endgame can be a challenge for the best of hunters out there, but with the right weapons and builds, even endgame tasks can easily be achieved. I'm Darkblade, and we're back with even more amazing builds for Monster Hunter World Iceborne. In this episode, we're going to be looking at endgame builds for the Longsword. The Longsword has gone through drastic changes since the introduction of Monster Hunter World Iceborne. With the new EI Slash, EI Spirit Slash, and Special Sheath, hunters are able to endlessly combo into the strong moves the weapon has available to it. On top of that, some of these moves like the EI Slash as well as the Foresight Slash enable a hunter to be defensive with the weapon whilst maintaining an assault on a monster. In the hands of an expert, this weapon can dance around the battlefield, almost eliminating any need for any defensive skills. The builds I use with the Longsword tend to focus more on DPS over anything else. Now a disclaimer for this series though, these builds are aimed for endgame hunters, having completed the main story and having access to all armors and weaponry. A large jewel collection is also desired, but you can always swap out jewels here and there if you do not have the one shown in this video. So the first build I use is the Master's Touch build. This build is a strong DPS build with high amounts of affinity and is perfect for anyone who dislikes having to maintain their sharpness gauge. With this build you can engage monsters for a long period of time without having to retreat or even potentially rebuff. So for this build you'll need the Kaiser Crown Beta, the Rex Raw Male Beta, Kaiser Vampraces Beta, Kaiser Coil Beta and the Garuga Greaves Beta. I'm also using a Challenger Charm 4 and for my weapon I'm using the Wyvern Blade Luna which is the Golden Raffian Longsword. This has an Affinity Increase Augmentation, Health Regen Augmentation and then an Augmentation of your choice to which I've gone with a Defense Increase. You can of course swap out the Lunar Longsword if you so desire for something else, but be mindful of the sharpness of whatever weapon you switch to. If they can get to purple sharpness for example, it may be worth dropping the Challenger Charm in favour for the Handicraft Charm. But anyway, as for jewels, remember what I said at the start of the video, depending on what you have access to you may have to swap out some here and there. With this build you've got a lot to play around with, to which I've gone for critical jewels to max out the crit boost skill, tenderizer jewels to max out the weakness exploit skill, a Challenger jewel to max out the Agitator skill, Vitality Jewels to give us maxed out health boost, Attack Jewels to get attack boost to at least level 4, Expert Jewels to give us a little bit of critical eye, and finally Sheave Jewels to max out the quick sheave skill. Finally for your Mantle Jewels, these are down to personal preference to which I've gone for Attack and Jumping Jewels. So if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 150 health, 100 stamina, which would be 200 health and 150 stamina when you're on a hunt and taking all your relevant consumables. You have an attack of 1056 with a decent chunk of white sharpness. You have 65% base affinity, which will easily be 100% so long as you're attacking monster weak points that have been tenderized first alongside other buffs in this build that yield bonus affinity. To be honest, in some respects, it could be considered wasted having a base affinity of 65 but we're aiming for our attacks to always be critting with this build. Anyway, you have a poison rating of 420, with a strong defense of 928 that is strong against fire, thunder and dragon, but unfortunately weak to water and ice. As for the skills, you have critical eye level 7, critical eye gives us a base increase to our affinity, you have attack boost level 5 which can be potentially level 7, attack boost increases the raw damage of this build, and at level 4 or above it gives you a bonus 5% affinity, you have agitator level 5, Agitator is a wonderful skill in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. When a monster becomes enraged, the Agitator buff will kick in, granting you bonus raw attack as well as bonus affinity. And Agitator works well in unison with the Clutch Claw's flinch shot. For example, when a monster isn't enraged and the Agitator buff isn't active, you can make use of the flinch shot to send a monster into a wall. Do this once or twice and it will enrage the monster, thus activating the Agitator buff. So you can kind of control this buff. Anyway, you have Health Boost Level 3, increasing our potential health to that maximum of 200. You have Critical Boost Level 3, allowing increased raw attack damage when we crit a monster. You have Weakness Exploit Level 3. Weakness Exploit increases our affinity by a set percentage when we're attacking monster weak points. And should these weak points be tenderized beforehand through Clutch Claw attacks, this affinity increase is even more. You have Quick Sheave Level 3. This is really a quality of life skill that the Longsword can make use of. Quick Sheave allows you to sheave your weapon at a fast rate. And this also applies to the Special Sheave, one of the new moves that the Longsword has access to. Whilst it's not essential to Longsword builds, it's a little bit of a bonus. Of course, if you did want to go for a different skill, you could potentially drop Quick Sheave. Anyway, you have Blast Attack Level 2. This is a byproduct of the gear. It's not needed on this build whatsoever. It will only come in useful if you were using a Blast weapon, as it would increase the Blast rating and build up of this build. 
You have Heat Guard Level 1, another byproduct of the gear, but allows us to resist the damaging effect of hot areas such as the lava zones in the Guiding Lands or the Elder's Recess. Next you have Latent Power Level 1, again another byproduct of the gear, but Latent Power is a buff that will kick in after you've been fighting a monster for a certain amount of time, or when a hunter takes a certain amount of damage. When that happens, this buff will kick in, granting reduced stamina depletion as well as bonus affinity. And then finally, you'll have a Vade Extender on your mantles, allowing us to roll further distances. This is purely optional, so use whatever you want to use in place of the jumping jewels if need be. And then finally, as for the set bonuses, you have the main reason for this build, which is Teostra's Technique Master's Touch, which prevents any sharpness loss on your weapon so long as you crit a monster. That's the reason we've gone for that high affinity. So there you have it. As you can see, this is a DPS focused build and many of you will argue this is the current kind of meta bar Safi Jiva weapons and armor. With this build, you're able to stay engaged with a monster for long periods of time without having to really retreat, resharpen or rebuff. But of course, every build has its pros and cons. The biggest pro for this build is its high affinity and thus high damage output. On top of that, it's a wonderful build that doesn't really have to worry about handicraft or losing sharpness on your weapon. And finally, when you are using the Wyvern Blade Luna, you have that bonus poison damage that can really rack up during master rank hunts, allowing for some unseen damage output. But unfortunately, every build has its cons. The main cons that I can think of for this build is that if you are wanting to switch to a different weapon that can potentially get to that purple sharpness, you're going to have to make sacrifices in terms of jewels or charms. And also, this build can kind of struggle if you're using a weapon that has a lot of negative affinity. Having a neutral or positive affinity is probably what you want to strive for so you can maintain that 100% affinity rating and thus prevent any sharpness loss. But regardless, this is an incredibly strong build which was considered meta for quite some time and it's perfect for anyone who dislikes having to sharpen their weapon. But anyway, let's move on to the next build which is the True Critical Element build. This build makes use of the True Critical Element skill and thus is an elemental DPS focused build with high affinity and elemental damage. So, for this build you'll need the Golden Loon Helm Beta, the Silver Soul Mail Beta, Silver Soul Braces Beta, Silver Soul Coil Beta, and the Silver Soul Greaves Beta. I'm also using a Handicraft Charm 4, and for my weapon I'm using the Wyvern Blade Pale. This is the Silver Raphalos Longsword. This has an affinity increase augmentation on it, as well as a health regen augmentation and an elemental up augmentation. You can swap some of these around if you so desire. For example, you could swap the health regen augmentation if you feel comfortable with this build's current defenses in favor of increasing the elemental up effect even more. So as for the jewels, you've got a fair few to play around with here, to which I've gone for blaze jewels to max out the fire attack rating of this build. I've then gone for tenderizer jewels for that weakness exploit, some expert jewels for some critical eye, a handicraft jewel to max out the handicraft skill, a vitality jewel to max out the health boost skill, a sharp jewel for protective polish, and then finally I had a jewel to play around with to which I've gone for a sated jewel. As for the jewels and the mantles, I've gone for defensive jewels here, so I've added protection jewels for that divine blessing whilst wearing the rocksteady mantle and hard defense whilst wearing the glider mantle. Of course, when it comes to mantle jewels, these are generally down to personal preference. So if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 150 health, 100 stamina, which would be 200 health and 150 stamina when you're on a hunt and taking all your relevant consumables. You'll have an attack of 941 with a decent chunk of purple sharpness. You have 45% affinity, which will be 95% affinity when you're attacking monster weak points that have been tenderized through clutch claw attacks first. You have a fire rating of 640 with a very strong defense of 939. That is exceedingly strong against fire and dragon, but unfortunately, weak to the other three elements. So as for the skills, you have fire attack level 6. Fire attack at level 6 increases the fire damage and rating of this build. You have handicraft level 5 increasing our sharpness, allowing this weapon to get to this purple sharpness. You have slinger capacity level 5. This is a byproduct of the gear. This increases the amount of slinger ammunition we can hold at any one time. You have health boost level 3, critical eye level 3, critical boost level 3. Now I should say with critical boost, remember that this only increases the raw attack portion of this build. It does nothing in terms of the elemental damage. So when you crit a monster, the 891 attack rating of the Wyvern Blade Pell will be increased, not the 450 elemental rating. Anyway, you have weakness exploit level 3, windproof level 1. Windproof is a byproduct of the gear that helps resist minor wind effects. You have free mill level 1, a byproduct of our jewels. 
This allows us to consume potions and other buffs without potentially actually using up the potion or consumable. It's a little quality of life skill, it's nothing too vital. Your protective polish level 1. Protective polish is a wonderful skill where after sharpening your weapon a protective coating will be put over your blade over your sharpness gauge in the top left of the screen preventing any sharpness loss for a small duration of time. And then finally you have the mantle skills which is defense boost level 6 increasing our defense rating whilst wearing the glider mantle and divine blessing level 2 which can potentially allow us to take less damage when we take a hit from a monster. But the main reason for this build is the set bonus, the Silver Raphalos Essence. When you're wearing a two piece you'll get the Slinger Ammo Secret which we've talked about already. This increases the Slinger Capacity skill from level 3 to a maximum of level 5. And for the four piece set which is what we're going for you'll get True Critical Element allowing the elemental portion of our attack to be increased when we crit a monster. So think of it like crit boost, but instead of for the raw damage, it actually goes for the elemental damage. And true critical element increases the damage even further than just critical element. And true critical element combined with critical boost means that the damage overall is going to be a lot higher with this build. But there we have it. As you can see, it is a strong elemental build. It would have been nice to get to 100% affinity, and if you want to, you can potentially drop a jewel here or there to get that extra bonus 5% affinity. The choice is always up to you. Also, this build can use any element you so desire, so long as you have the corresponding jewels. So you could swap out the weapon for a thunder element or ice element, but if you do so, remember to swap out the jewels to match that said element. But of course, every build has its pros and cons. The biggest pro for this build is its high elemental damage and affinity. It's also a build that can use pretty much any element, so long as you have the jewels, so it's easily customizable. And on top of that, because of this build's high handicraft rating, it can get away with using pretty much any weapon and get it to white or even purple sharpness. However, there are cons for this build. The biggest, unfortunately, is it's a jewel hungry build, requiring a lot of jewels, especially elemental jewels, which can be tricky to get a hold of at times. And unfortunately, bar maybe health boost, it really lacks in quality of life skills. But regardless, this is a strong build, especially when you're taking into account a monster's elemental weaknesses. Do this and you should be able to take on hunts quite successfully. Which brings us on to the next build, which is the Frostcraft build. This is a personal favourite of mine, but there is more to the build than just looks. Thanks to the Velkana set bonus, it introduces a completely new gauge known as Frostcraft, which the longsword can really make use of. So for this build you'll need the Golden Headdress Beta, the Rhyme Guard Mel Beta, Rhyme Guard Van Braces Beta, Rhyme Guard Coil Beta, Rhyme Guard Grease Beta, and the Critical Charm 2. For my weapon I'm also using the Stygian Gula, which is the Stygian Zenoga Longsword, that has an Affinity Increase Augmentation, Health Regen Augmentation, and then an Augmentation of your choice, to which I've gone for an Element Up Augmentation. Of course you can quite easily swap this weapon out for something else if you so desire. But as for the jewels, you've got a few to play around with here, to which I've gone for Draw Jewel to max out the Critical Draw skill, Expert Jewels to give us a little bit of Critical Eye, a Critical Jewel to max out the Crit Boost skill, Tenderizer Jewel to max out the Weakness Exploit skill, Vitality Jewels to max out the Health Boost skill, a Sharp Jewel for Protective Polish, a Hard Enjoy Jewel to max out the Item Prolonger skill, and I had a byproduct on the Tenderizer Jewel of a Protection Jewel to give us a little bit of Divine Blessing. As for the Mantle Jewels, these are done to personal preference. For the Glider Mantle, I've gone for Mighty and Protection Jewels to max out the Divine Blessing skill, as well as give us a little bit of Maximum Might while we're wearing this Mantle. And for the Temporal Mantle, I've gone for Expert Jewels to give us a little bit of Critical Eye. So if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 150 health, 100 stamina, which will be 200 health and 150 stamina when you're on a hunt and taking all the relevant consumables. You have an attack of 941 with a decent chunk of purple sharpness. You have 35% affinity, which will be 85% affinity when you're attacking monster weak points that have been tenderized through clutch claw attacks first. And this is not including the bonus that critical draw applies which we'll talk about in a minute. You have a Dragon Elemental rating of 330 with average Elder Seal, and you'll have a decent defense of 901. That is strong against water and ice, but unfortunately a little bit weak to the other elements. As for the skills, you have Critical Eye level five, which can potentially be level seven when you're wearing your mantles. You have Health Boost level three, Critical Boost level three, Weakness Exploit level three, Critical Draw level 3. Critical Draw is a skill that the Longsword can really make use of. Basically when you perform drawn attacks it increases your affinity and at level 3 it will be 100% for that draw attack. And this does apply to draw attacks made from the Longsword's special sheath which includes the EI Slash and EI Spirit Slash. 
so you're always guaranteed for those two moves to always crit a monster. You have Quick Sheave level 3, Item Prolonger level 3. Item Prolonger is thanks to the Hard and Join Duel. This allows items and buffs from items to remain active for longer periods and this also works in unison with Protective Polish which is the main reason why we've taken this skill, allowing that Protective Coating to last for longer. Anyway, you have Flinch 3 level 2, a byproduct of the gear that helps resist minor knockbacks or weaker attacks. You have Divine Blessing level 1 which could potentially be level 3. You have Protective Polish level 1 and finally Maximum Might at potential level 2. Maximum Might increases our affinity by up to 20% at level 2 so long as our stamina has been full for a small amount of time. As soon as we use stamina up, the buff will fade and we'll have to wait for it to kick back in again. But the main reason behind this build is the set bonus, Velkana's Divinity. Now for the two set bonus, for wearing two pieces of the Velkana armor, you'll get Critical Element, which increases the elemental damage of our attacks when we crit a monster. Thus the reason we are still using an elemental weapon with this build. You can use other weapons without elements if you so wish, but it means this Critical Element skill will be wasted unfortunately. However, the main reason is the four set bonus, Frostcraft. This gives hunters a second gauge up in the top left underneath the health and stamina bar which fills up whilst your weapon is sheathed. Now this gauge has different stages and at each stage depending on how full the gauge is hunters will receive bonus attack. However once a hunter starts attacking a monster with each swing of their weapon that connects it depletes this gauge over time. But the longsword can really make use of this buff. This is all thanks to the special sheath. Because this stance counts as the weapon being sheathed, it means that you're able to recharge that Frostcraft gauge and gain that bonus attack again before you go into your next combo or rotation. Sometimes you have to be a bit patient when you do sheathe your weapon, as it takes a couple of seconds for the Frostcraft gauge to recharge completely, but it shouldn't interrupt your rotations too much. Now if you're not using a HUD or you're not looking at the gauge in the top corner you can also tell when the Frostcraft buff is kicking in thanks to the icy flame emanating from your weapon. But there we have it, ultimately there aren't a lot of weapons out there that can really make use of the Frostcraft set bonus. The longsword is one of the few weapons that can really make use of it, allowing for a different kind of longsword playstyle that is more reactionary than a full on offensive playstyle. For example, every time you're waiting for that Frostcraft buff to kick in, a monster can attack you during this time, to which a hunter needs to react with either the EI Spirit Slash or EI Slash. But I for one personally find this a very entertaining way to play the longsword. But anyway, as always there are pros and cons. The biggest pro for this build is the fact that it can really utilise the Frostcraft skill. This combined with the affinity based skills this build has means that the damage output is also quite strong. And finally I know this is subjective but I personally also feel this is one of the better looking builds in the game and it's all thanks to that Velkana armour. Unfortunately though there are cons to this build, one of which is that if you want to use a different weapon to get the most you need a weapon that has an element and unfortunately also it means that if you do want to switch weapons and you have a weapon that needs handicraft you're going to have to make sacrifices somewhere. But nonetheless, like I said, I personally find this a fun build to use. Also, I should mention that if you don't have access to Rajang yet, you may have to swap out the Rajang Helm for an alternative piece such as the Fogel Anjanath Helm which has similar stats and slots. But if you're looking for a build that uses the Velkana armor set and that Frostcraft skill, this is a build to consider. So that brings us to the next build which is the True Critical Status build. This could be considered the sister build of the True Critical Element build, making this an element focused build that focuses on high DPS. Also thanks to the set bonuses found on the armor we're using, this build actually has quite a few defensive options. So for this build you need the Golden Loon Helm Beta, Golden Loon Mail Beta, the Shara Ishvada Braces Beta, Golden Loon Coil Beta and the Golden Loon Greaves Beta. I'm also using the Handicraft Charm 4 again and for my weapon I'm using the Basil Prozio Rook Sera, which is the Seven Basil Juice Longsword. This has an Affinity Increase Augmentation, Health Regen Augmentation and then a Status Effect Up Augmentation. You can of course replace this with any weapon you want so long as it's an ailment weapon. So as for the jewels, you've only got a few to play around with here. Firstly I've gone for blast jewels to max out the blast rating of this build as this weapon is a blast longsword. Of course the blast jewels will be replaced to match whatever ailment you are using. I've gone for a sharp jewel for that protected polish. Sheave and expert jewels for both critical eye and that quick sheave skill. A critical jewel to max out the crit boost skill. Vitality jewel to max out health boost. Tenderizer jewels to max out weakness exploit. And as for the mantle jewels, I've gone for challenger jewels 
The Challenger Protection Jewel here is a mistake. You don't need any Protection Jewels with this build. I don't know why I put it there, but hey ho. And as for the Temporal Mantle, I've gone for a few Expert Jewels. So if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 150 health, 100 stamina, which will be 200 health and 150 stamina when you're on a hunt and taking all your relevant consumables. You have an attack of 908 with a decent chunk of purple sharpness. You have 25% base affinity, which will be at least 75% affinity when you're on a hunt and you're attacking monster weak points that have been tenderized through clutch claw attacks first. This can be potentially even more depending on the mantles you're wearing. You have a blast rating of 440 with a strong defense of 919 that is strong against fire and dragon but unfortunately weak to the other elements. As for the skills you have critical eye at level 5, potentially level 7. You have divine blessing level 5. This is actually a byproduct of the gear we're wearing. Divine blessing at level 5 greatly increases the chance of receiving less damage when we take a hit from a monster, adding to this build's overall survivability. You have blast attack level 4 increasing the blast rating and build up of this build. You have handicraft level 4, health boost level 3, critical boost level 3, weakness exploit level 3, quick sheath level 3, protective polish level 1 and potentially agitated at level 3 when you're wearing your mantles. But as for the set bonus you have the gold raffian essence. The two set bonus provides you with the divine blessing secret allowing divine blessing to go from level 3 to that potential level 5 greatly increases our survivability and you'll have true critical status which increases the abnormal status damage, so paralysis, poison, blast, sleep, so on, when landing critical hits. And true critical status increases this even more than just the base critical status. This ultimately will also lead to more buildup of whatever ailment you are using, so this build can work with pretty much any ailment. Just remember to swap up the blast jewels to match whatever ailment you are using. I went for blast personally because I feel that blast benefits the most from critical status but the choice is up to you but every build has its pros and cons the biggest pro for this build is its decent dps through use of the ailments whether you're using blast to get those extra bursts of damage through the blast procs or you're using a sleep build for controlled wake up attacks paralysis for a period of uninterrupted attacks or even poison for a constant damage over time effect the damage does rack up when using this build. It won't feel like a conventional damage output, but it's there nonetheless. On top of that, this is a build that can use any ailment, so you can easily swap out the weapon for something else you so desire, so it's easily customizable. On top of that, the gold raffian set bonus, having that divine blessing at level five, greatly increases this build's survivability, regardless of if you're making use of the foresight slash or EI slash. But unfortunately, every build has its downsides. Unfortunately this build does need high affinity to be most effective and unfortunately we wasn't really able to get to that 100% affinity whilst using this build and unfortunately the last con which really applies for every monster out there when it comes to ailments is that unfortunately as a fight goes on the more the monster builds up to tolerance and resistance to the various ailment effects resulting in less and less procs. Ultimately this is a fun build to use especially if you like ailment weapons. The bonus of having Divine Blessing at level 5 is also a boon on this build, allowing hunters to easily survive some of the most challenging tasks in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Also with this build, remember to take into account a monster's ailment resistances as this can potentially lead to more DPS. But anyway, that moves us on to the final build, which is the Guiding Lands Gaia's Veil build. This build is a unique build utilizing the entire Shara Ishvalda set and thus providing us with the True Guy's Veil set bonus, which means with this build you do need to take into account the jewels and mantles you use. So for this build you need the Shara Ishvalda Helm Beta, Mel Beta, Braces Beta, Coil Beta and Grease Beta. I'm also using a Challenger Charm 4 and for my weapon I'm using the Hellish Slasher. You can of course replace this with other weapons such as the Wyvern Blade Luna the gold raffian longsword and come out with pretty much similar results. The main reason I'm using the hellish slasher is because it's an elementalist weapon and thus be used against any monster. But as for the augmentations I've gone for an infinity increase augmentation, health regen augmentation and an attack increase augmentation. Finally for the mantles I would strongly advise taking the glider mantle and then an elemental mantle to counter whatever monster you're facing. But as for the jewels you got a decent amount to play with here. Firstly, you'll need the jewels that are kind of mandatory for the Guiding Lands. This includes a Geology Jewel to provide the Geologist skill, as well as a Fortitude Jewel to provide the Fortify skill, and Destroyer Jewels to provide us the Partbreaker skill. Now the Destroyer Jewels with this build are located in the Mantles, but thanks to True Guy's Veil, 
and the mantles we're actually using, it means that we should be able to constantly be wearing a mantle during a fight. By the time one mantle wears off, the other one should be off cooldown, and so on and so forth. Anyway, as for the other jewels, I've gone for critical jewels for that critical boost skill, sheave jewels for that quick sheave skill, expert jewels for some critical eye, tenderizer jewels for some weakness exploit, an elementalist jewel for that non-elemental boost skill, challenger jewels to max out the agitator skill, and vitality jewels to max out the health boost skill. So if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 150 health, 100 stamina, which would be 200 health and 150 stamina. When you're on a hunt and taking all your relevant consumables, you have an attack of 1036 with white sharpness. You have 35% affinity, which will be 85% affinity when you're on a hunt and attacking monster weak points first. This can be potentially 95% when the agitated skill kicks in. You have no element with an exceedingly high defense of 976. That is neutral against fire, strong against thunder, neutral against dragon, but unfortunately weak to water and ice. But the elemental weaknesses shouldn't be that much of an issue considering you'll be taking into battle one of the various elemental mantles. As for the skills, you have critical eye at level 5, agitator level 5, health boost level 3, critical boost level 3, weakness exploit level 3, recovery up level 2. This is a byproduct of the gear but can still be useful. Recovery up increases the amount we heal through healing methods and effects such as potions. You have quick sheath level 2, it would have been nice to get this higher but it's not needed. You have coalescence level 2, a byproduct of the gear. This increases our raw attack as well as ailment and elemental rating when we remove a blight from our hunter. You have defense boost level 1, again a byproduct of the gear but increases the defense rating of this build. You have part breaker level 1, although this can be potentially level 3, increasing our chances at breaking monster body parts. And with this build and the mantles we are using, this should be at level 3 pretty much throughout the entirety of a hunt. And Part Breaker is very useful in the Guiding Lands as it allows you to more easily knock off the monster materials that are the whole point behind the Guiding Lands. Anyway, we have Fortify level 1, which again is another skill that is useful for the Guiding Lands. This basically increases our attack and defense, should we faint, and can stack up to a maximum of 2 times. You have Geologist level 1, which the reason we are using it in the Guidance Lands, it currently allows us to loot monster materials twice instead of just once, especially on the higher tier monsters. Whether this is a bug or not, I'm not so sure, but it's still currently working at the time of this video being made. You'll also have Tool Specialist level 1, although this potentially can be level 3, thanks to the jewels we're wearing in the Glider Mantle. This reduces the cooldown on our mantles, and even just at level 1, it normally means that the mantles line up with one another. So by the time one is about to run out, the other one should be off cooldown and ready to be used. You'll also have non-elemental boost level 1, increasing the raw attack of weapons that have their element or element hidden, as is the case with the hellish slasher. And finally you'll have the set bonus, Shara Ishvalda Divinity, True Gaia's Veil. True Gaia's Veil is a unique skill that was added with Monster Hunter World Iceborne that allows hunters, whilst they're wearing their mantle, to automatically gain the skills Tremor Resistance Level 3, which nullifies minor and major ground tremors. They'll gain Earplugs Level 5, ignoring all monster roars. They'll get Maximum Windproof, which negates minor and major wind pressure, and they'll also gain Flinch Free Level 3, preventing all knockbacks and tripping, ultimately providing you a lot of quality of life skills and defensive skills. This combined with the elemental resistances that the mantles provide, make this a very strong build to use. So there you have it, that is the build that I tend to use in the Gaijin Lands. Like I said, you can swap out the Hellish Slasher for a different weapon if you so desire. Like I said, my personal favourites to choose apart from the Hellish Slasher would be the Wyvern Blade Luna, or failing that, the Ruinous Extermination, which is the Ruiner No Gigante Longsword. Any of these weapons work fine with this build, and if you do swap it out, just remember that you can drop the non-elemental boost jaw if you so desire. But of course, every build has pros and cons. The biggest pros for this build, I would say, are its decent damage output. It's also a build that can be used against any monster in the Gaiden Lands. And, thanks to the True Guy's Veil, it has wonderful quality of life skills. But unfortunately, the biggest con with this build is the fact that it does rely on mantles. But should you have all the upgraded mantles, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. On top of that, the armor used in this build looks awesome, and I love making use of it. So there we have it. Those are endgame builds that I use for the longsword in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Now of course there are a lot more endgame builds to come, especially in regards to Safi Jiva as well as the Arch-Tempered Monsters that are on the way. And as I always say, you don't have to use what is used in these videos, as most tasks in Monster Hunter World Iceborne can be taken on with any weapon or gear set. But anyway, I hope you found this video helpful or informative, 
And until next time, I've been Dabley, bringing you endgame longsword builds and Monster Underworld Iceborne. Hope you enjoyed the video, thanks for watching, subscribe and like for more.